Hey everyone, welcome. We're just admitting more folks. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Hey, St. George is on. Hey, Kay, I talked with Kay the other night. Hi, Kay. Good to see you. Congratulations on the military ban list, Kay. Oh, I see Bree is on from Florida. Hi, Bree. It's good to see you on here. And one of my all-time activist heroes, Jude Patton, is on. How you doing, Jude? Well, you can't answer me, so I, I don't know why. <laughs> how you doing, but good to see you. Just this so is our opportunity to tell all our bad jokes. <laughs> right. Uh, just so everyone's aware, we're just going to give it a few seconds for folks to log in, um, and we'll get started in about one minute. So just sit tight. Oh, Clemmy's on. Hi, Clemmy. It's good to see you, or see your name anyways. Can't really see you, but hi. Hey, Clemmy. Boy, it's, uh, it's, it's awkward saying people's names because the list is going so big so fast that I'm sure I'm leaving people off. Um, and I really feel bad about that. All right, just give about 30 more seconds here and we'll get started. Good to see everybody, even if I didn't say your name and I can't look at the list anymore. Sorry, everybody. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get things started here. It looks like we've started slowing down the trickle and as I, people um, log on. Oh, Rowie just signed on. Hi, Rowie. Um, as people sign on, um, we will, uh, you know, you all can get yourselves up to speed. Um, so good evening. Uh, my name is Daniel Schaub. I use he, him pronouns, and I am the development director for NCTE and uh, the NCTE Action Fund. I am thrilled to welcome you all tonight um, to our webinar to discuss uh, NCTE's policy priorities as we move forward in 2021. Uh, we are obviously extraordinarily excited for the uh, policy opportunities that we finally have this year. Um, and we're thrilled to share with you some of our top priorities at both the state and the federal level um, tonight. Um, you know, on the flip side, we, we do know that anti-trans attacks are going to be coming our way in states across the countries. We've already been getting a few of them. Um, and we are prepared to mobilize our wide-reaching network of trans activists and allies to fight any and all of these harmful proposals. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Uh, with me tonight, I have Mara Kiesling, founder and executive director of NCTE, and someone who many of you know, if not all of you. Uh, she is a crucial voice here on Capitol Hill and across the country. Also joining me tonight is Rodrigo hang Um Rodrigo, uh, or Rigo, is uh, NCTE's deputy executive director. Um, and uh, he coordinates our advocacy and all of our organizing efforts as well. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Dee Ojeda. Uh, Dee is our policy advocate for NCTE, and they work very closely with Rigo and our policy team. As I'm sure many of you know, um, you probably may have seen something on the news. Last week, we celebrated a not so small event, um, the inauguration, uh, just one week ago today. Um, the new administration and Congress will strengthen our work at the federal level, and we are pleased to welcome their partnership as we advocate for trans-friendly policies nationwide. Um, for today's conversation, uh, Mara, Rigo, and Dee will begin by presenting our work at the federal level um, and some of our priorities that we have for the coming year. Um, then Rigo will go into discussing our state-level priorities. Um, we're going to do our best to leave about 15 minutes at the end of tonight's webinar. Uh, to answer any questions that you all have, beginning with those that were pre-submitted um, on the webinar sign up form. Uh, if you have any questions that you think of as we go along, please uh, feel free at the bottom of your screen, there should be a button that says Q&A. Um, go ahead and click that button uh, to submit your question. And um, you know, if we have time tonight, we will try to answer them. Um, but if not, uh, somebody from our staff will be in touch after the webinar is over. Um, one final point, actually, before we get to our panelists, I just wanted to let folks know that tonight's call is an off-the-record community call um, and is not intended to be a media call. 
So if you're a journalist, you are welcome to stay on in your personal capacity, of course, um, but not in an official uh, work capacity. Um, if you would like to follow up with NCTE, please contact the NCTE media office um, and we would be pleased to discuss our 2021 policy priorities with you there. Uh, and with that, I will pass off this discussion to Rigo, who will review some of our early year victories for NCTE. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us tonight and thanks Daniel for organizing this. Again, I'm Rodrigo and I'm so happy you all took the time to be with us here. We have a lot of info to share. We wanna start off to kick off our celebration of our work in Georgia. It might feel like a long time ago now, but uh, if you can believe it, the Georgia Senate races only ended this month. It's been a long couple of weeks. You know, throughout December and January, we ran a big get out the vote effort. Our goal was to get trans and allied people to the polls. Georgia has really tough voter ID laws. That can make some of us nervous or confused about voting. At NCTE, we want to lift those barriers for you. We want voting to be simple and easy. So we ran a whole initiative to help answer questions and make voting accessible. Our goal was to encourage as many trans and allied people as possible to vote. We did that throughout the presidential race, but we did not stop there. We kept going and we made it happen in Georgia too. We worked really closely with our partners on the ground in the state. We educated voters on their rights when casting a ballot and explained what to do if you had recently updated your name or gender marker on your ID. I'm personally really excited that we also launched peer-to-peer -peer texting. This was the very first time that NCT had used this tool and it's a really effective way to reach voters. Research has consistently shown that it's a powerful tool to ensure people really get out to vote. So we're thrilled to have launched this in Georgia, and now we're even expanding it to more states. Trans people and allies have a critical role to play in our democracy. So I'm really proud of NCTE's work in record-breaking turnout in those Georgia runoffs. And now I'll turn it over to Mara, who has some exciting federal policy updates to share. You know, it's Zoom. We're all we're all figuring this out. <laughs> Every time I'm on Zoom, I forget to unmute before I start talking. Sorry about that, everybody. Hey, today is just one week since the Biden the Biden Harris administration started, and we're already seeing forward movement on our agenda. We're going to talk a little bit about the the most recent quick successes we've had, which are huge, by the way. They're not just little tiny things. Um, but we're also going to talk a little bit about the, 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 the broader agenda that we have for the federal government. We're not going to be able to cover everything, but, it, but it, it, we, we've, had, we've had some questions asked about some other things, and so we'll answer those and um, you can follow Daniel's directions um, for questions. But um, let me get into it. So um, this, this past year, NCTE Action Fund, our C4 arm, was the first national LGBT organization to endorse um, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And we knew that we could work with them. And we're already seeing after one week um, and a really fruitful transition period that we can work with them. For the, for the last four years, boy, trans and non-binary people have just been under fire with a constant onslaught of just hostile actions from, from the last administration. So we knew we had to work to elect a president who, who cares about trans people and our families and our allies or cares about people at all. Um, and um, if you haven't seen it through a series of Transform the White House forums, which you can actually see at transformthewhitehouse.org still, um, we interviewed, um, I think nine major candidates for president on their um, on their plans for the presidency and, and, and trans policy. And we did interview now President Biden and Senator Harris uh, and seven others. And ultimately we endorsed Joe Biden for president once he won the primary. Um, just recognizing that, you know, obviously he was the obvious choice um, for moving forward. And sure enough, shortly after taking office, the president really, really quickly took action on several real top priorities for us, including uh, a repeal of the transmilitary ban on Monday of this week, 
Um, and then last week, making sure that the, um, the Bostock decision and all of the work that the litigation organizations and others and us have done over the last years um, is properly and quickly implemented all across the federal government so that the federal government will <clears throat> enforce sex discrimination laws against discrimination um, against um, trans and LGBT people. So we worked on each of these issues for years and, and I'm gonna keep working on them to make sure they're, they're implemented right. I just wanna talk about why these two are important. A military ban, um, it's not everybody's cup of tea, right? I, it, it, a lot of trans people wouldn't have prioritized it, but, but here's the thing about it. It, it, it. it is federal government discriminating against people in employment. Um, that's a simple way to look at it. But not only that, for whatever, uh, for good reasons or bad reasons, service members are among the most respected people in America. And by attacking trans service members, they tried to erase us. That was a big part of what President Trump and his administration were trying to do. Uh, the military ban has been overturned. You know, some of the policies are going to take a couple months to, to shake out a little bit, but the ban is over. Trans people can serve openly and honestly in the military. And as for the executive order on sex discrimination and the Bostock decision, um, it's just so important. Um, the Trump administration simply was not enforcing federal anti-discrimination laws that they were uh, required to, to enforce. Um, and we believe there's a lot of places across the federal government where this is gonna have an impact. And a lot of our agenda will, will be taken care of because of this executive order last week on his very first day in office. That's really an incredible thing. We wouldn't have expected that even eight or 12 years ago with President Obama, but, but President Biden got right to work for us. And then the other really wonderful thing that's happened this week already is that uh, Dr. Rachel Levine, the Secretary of Health in Pennsylvania has been nominated to be the Assistant Secretary of Health. Uh, uh, those of us in Washington call the Assistant Secretary of Health the ASH, and the ASH is a really key pivotal um, role in the Department of Health and Human Services, which is an agency we really need to be at the table at. And having a trans person um, there is really uh, just incredibly important. And I, I will just note that uh, Dr. Levine will be the first ever trans person put up before the Senate for a confirmation. And that's groundbreaking and amazing. Um, so beyond those recent victories, there's so much more to be done. I, I have our, you know, it's something like 85 point agenda right here. Um, and we'll be talking more about it and getting into it more as, as the weeks go on. But let me talk to you about a couple highlights uh, of it. First um, is the Equality Act. Um, the, the Equality Act, for those of you who don't know, essentially replaced and built on um, what used to be called ENDA, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. But the Equality Act is so much bigger and so much more. Um, it's, it's the centerpiece trans and LGBTQ uh, federal legislation. Um, it will be um, introduced in both the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate in mid-February. Um, that's still up in the air a little bit because of the, um, the impeachment of the last president. Um, we finally have a chance to move it in both chambers and have a president who will sign it. Um, it doesn't mean it's gonna be an easy lift. Um, we will almost certainly need to find 10 Republicans to vote for it. And I couldn't honestly tell you, I know exactly who those 10 are gonna be. We have some really good ideas and all our allies are gathering. Um, we're really working hard on that. I, I am one of the co-chairs of the Equality Act Coalition at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. And, we're already working on this and we're going to get it done. So what, what does the Equality Act do? Um, it, it, it clarifies and expands legal protections to, to millions of Americans who face all kinds of discrimination because of our gender identity or sexual orientation uh, in employment, housing, education, public spaces, federal programs, credit, uh, like loans and such. Uh, and jury service. Um, why this is really important with, even with the Bostock decision, even with the president's executive order, um, you know, we, we got a couple very astute questions from, from some of you on the phone about how we're gonna end this back and forth 
um, where we feel protect, we don't feel protected under Bush, then we feel protected under Obama, then we don't feel protected under um, Trump, and then we do feel protected under Biden. Passing the Equality Act is a really, really important way to stabilize that, clarify that, and make absolutely sure that everybody understands that it is illegal to discriminate against us. Um, it's, we call it a belt and suspenders thing. We have sex discrimination laws, but we actually do need a law and it will smooth things out permanently if we have a law that says you can't discriminate based on gender identity and sexual orientation. Um, and this is gonna send a nationwide message that mistreatment is, is not just morally wrong, but it is illegal. Um, and that's so important. So, you know, there's, there's about 2 million trans people right now who live in states that don't have sufficient protections for LGBT people, even with the Bostock decision. We just need to get that fixed. Um, so it, it, it will become our shield for trans and non-binary people to protect ourselves from the attacks on our well-being. Um, from a wide range of sources. So I'm gonna, um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that more if you'd like. Um, uh, you know, prognosis, I think we'll pass it very quickly in the House of Representatives. Um, and then we will be working, we will be doing a campaign, we will be working our hearts out trying to get it past the Senate. Uh, if it passes the House and the Senate, I think there is no question at all that President Biden will sign it. Um, so now I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Dee, who's going to talk a little bit about um, health care and some stuff. Thanks, Dee. Thank you, Mara. Uh, so the pandemic has taught us that this country's health care infrastructure can't probably handle a crisis of this scale, um, which is resulting in a response that is, quite frankly, disjointed, ineffectual, and prejudice towards the most vulnerable population, but especially for trans people and people of color. Not only has the pandemic adversely affected our community, it has presented unique challenges in a fight for accessible and safe health care for all of us across this country. Last year, we were dismayed to see the federal administration's continued attacks on trans-related health care, including rolling back HHS 1557, which is the non-discrimination provision of the Affordable Care Act. It's an important component of the bill's civil rights protections. Um, and also, state legislatures also joined the federal administration in attacking our community's most vulnerable, um, which are the transgender youth through disc discriminatory bills that, are, that aim to criminalize medical care provided to trans youth. We, success we successfully pushed back on many of these proposed policies and regulations and ensuring that our community stays protected during the worst pandemic in a century. With a new administration, we are poised to eliminate the few pieces of federal regulatory policies limiting and preventing gender affirming care. This also includes the VA's policy on transition related surgeries. We will also reinstall and strengthen policies and regulations like section 5057 to discourage and prevent future attacks from happening. In terms of our COVID response, we will also be continuing to guide our partners and allies through this terrible pandemic. We have published informative pieces on staying healthy and safe through the pandemic, acknowledging the worst aspects of this disease are especially dangerous to trans people and our families. As vaccines are rolled out across the country, we have advocated for trans competent health clinics that are available to administer the vaccine. Furthermore, it is important for us that trans people and our families feel safe visiting a clinic to receive the vaccine. This requires a push to make sure these clinics are prepared to work with trans patients and ensuring that there are non-discrimination procedures in place for medical providers. And we have already seen strong support for such inclusivity in healthcare from the current administration. For example, as recent as last Friday, the First Lady, Dr. Joe Biden, visited my clinic, uh, Whitman Walker Clinic, which is DC's community health center, known to cater to healthcare needs of, of, of our trans community. And of course, health is much more than just going to the doctor. 
A healthy life is influenced by reliable housing, safe transportation, accessible facilities, and a clean environment. And in 2020, we defended the HUD Equal Access Rule, which ensures equal access for trans people in places like homeless shelters from discriminatory attacks that sought to undermine safe shelters for trans people. We mobilized over 8,000 public comments and adv advocating for the rule and calling on HUD to just back off. Moreover, we built a coalition of partners, including interfaith and anti-domestic violence adv advocacy groups. You know, the very ones that the last administration claimed to want to protect. And together, we submitted 66,000 comments to HUD, one of the highest comment submission in HUD to date. And in December, we learned the HUD abandoned his, its, its attempt to eliminate the rule, marking an end ear victory for trans people and for NCTE as well, and signaling a more inclusive perspective adopted by the Biden-Harris administration. I will now turn back to Mara for her thoughts on some of our other areas of work. Thank you so much, Dee. Um, it's, uh... It's remarkable what we're going to be able to get done in healthcare advocacy and 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 what so many folks have already done. Um, so, in addition to the healthcare stuff, we have a whole range of issues from uh, from ID documents to um, what, what. Let me just back up and say, you know, healthcare is a, a pretty broad thing too. We're we're looking at the healthcare that Dee just talked about. We're also very much looking at uh, healthcare in the Veterans Administration and TRICARE in the Defense Department and, and Medicare and Medicaid. I know there were a lot of questions asked about that. Um, they're all on our radar and we'll be, um, we'll be answering that a little bit more later. But we have a huge agenda and really high hopes of making quick and importantly lasting progress. So first, let me just say a quick word about education. Um, obviously, we have a lot to undo from the last administration and, and Betsy DeVos. Um, you know, we have a, a real proactive agenda to, around letting trans kids be kids to, to learn safely and productively and to be able to participate in, in all school programs and all school facilities. Um, and you'll be seeing a lot of work on that. Um, we are going to be advocating really strongly with the Biden administration to, to create a, a national initiative on violence against black trans women and, and other trans women of color. Um, this is not fully fleshed out with the administration by any means yet, but it, it, it will include leadership from the White House, from the president, that this is an issue of national importance and urgency. Um, it will involve listening to the folks who are most impacted by this before any initiative is created. Um, but it has to be more than just meetings at the White House. It has to be around a very fulsome policy agenda, um, around economic opportunity, around violence, sure. But, but this is a complex criminological and sociological and economic problem. Um, and it needs to be addressed holistically. And we need the federal government involved collecting data, talking to the people most involved, and putting some muscle behind it. Um, so watch for, for, um, watch for that in the coming, uh, in the coming months. Um, and next, I'd like to hand it over to Rodrigo um, to talk about what's going on at the state level. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and Rodrigo, I know I'm talking way too fast. I think you can yeah, I'm a uh, Cuban and we always talk too fast. So I'm going to try to slow that on down. <laughs> so I'm talking about how I was talking too fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, <laughs> it's always a thing for me too. Well, yeah, so uh, thanks, Mara. I'm going to go into our state legislative work, which is already out the gate, already off to a fast start. A lot of the state legislatures have already started their sessions for 2021, and they're going to be really active until at least April. We're mostly fighting two kinds of attacks. The first is trans youth health care bans. These bad bills seek to criminalize any transition-related care for young people. They threaten to charge doctors hefty fines or even revoke their medical licenses just for providing the best practice medical care that's actually recognized by the American Medical Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics. These bans are dangerous because of course, healthcare decisions should be between patients and their doctors, 
not politicians. The second kind of attack we're facing is trans student athlete bans. These bans seek to essentially prohibit young trans people from playing school sports. They would categorically ban trans youth from playing on the team of their authentic gender. And as we all know, if you can't play on the team of your real gender, you basically can't play on a team at all. Some of the bills go after trans girls specifically. These bans send a terrible message that trans youth should be ostracized. They single trans youth out. Trans youth play school sports for the same reason as any other student, to learn teamwork and discipline, to stay fit, and to be with their friends. As adults, our job is to support young people, not to put a target on their back. Now you probably noticed that both of these attacks go after young people. That is not a coincidence. The opposition is deliberately targeting the most vulnerable in our community. They are going after trans youth as a way to chip away at support for trans rights overall. But we are not going to let that happen. When they go after trans kids, we fight back. So let me walk you through the latest on both of these kinds of bills. First off, the youth sports bans. Right now, we're focused on Montana, where they've actually proposed both of these kinds of bills, a student athlete ban and a healthcare ban, though I might have an update on that in a few minutes because that healthcare ban bill is in motion as we speak. There's a debate happening involving the House floor, even while we're doing this webinar. So I might, I'm getting some messages, might have an update in a moment. But on the sports ban especially, we're working closely with our partners on the ground in the state. We're mobilizing constituents to contact their legislators. We're sending action alerts. We're leveraging social media. And we're replicating that peer-to-peer -peer texting program that I talked about with Georgia. So we are organizing trans and allied people in the state to put pressure on their elected officials. We're also working with the NCAA. Now, if you are like me and you are not much of a sports person, I will explain <laughs> that the NCAA is the governing body regulating college student athletics. They're very influential. We're working to get them to withhold college playoff and championship games in states with anti-trans policies like this. We lobbied them last year to pull out of Idaho after that state passed a student athlete ban known as HB 500. This would make it clear that trans sports bans like this won't be tolerated. So we're continuing to lobby and pressure the NCAA to do the right thing and stand up against discrimination. Unfortunately, Montana is not the only state where we have to fight. Student athlete bans have also been proposed in the following states. So listen up, if you hear your state called we need you to contact your legislators. Here's the list. Oklahoma, South Carolina, North Dakota, Tennessee, Kentucky, New Hampshire, and of course, Montana. If you live in any of those states, go to transequality.org and click on our action center. It's right there on the homepage. Again, that is transequality.org, click on our action center, contact your elected officials and tell them that you will not tolerate this. Now I'll say a bit about the youth healthcare bans too. Again, these bills seek to criminalize any transition related care for young people. And again, this is opposed by every single leading medical institution, including the American Medical Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics. We're fighting back against these two. We're analyzing policy, mobilizing constituents to contact their legislators, and we're doing all of it in coordination with state and local groups on the ground. We successfully defeated a proposed healthcare ban in South Dakota last year. So we're working hard to apply those lessons learned this time around. Now, here's the list of states facing these healthcare bans. So again, listen up. If you hear your state called, we need you to contact your legislators. Here's that list, Alabama, Montana, Indiana, Utah, Mississippi, Missouri, New Hampshire, and Texas. 
If you live in any of these states, go to transequality.org and click on our action center. I am being repetitive because it is that important. Uh, click on the action center, contact your elected officials. And same thing if you have family or friends in those states, direct them to the website too. Every voice counts and we need everyone to speak out. Uh, now, I think I, yes, I think this is the latest info. Live updates from Montana. I am not kidding. This bill is a live wire. We had whiplash yesterday. We thought it was over and then it came back in what's called a smoke out. If anyone has questions about nerdy state legislative politics, I can fill you in. Um, but it's been moving on the House floor all week. And as of this evening, it appears that the ban has been voted down, which is a huge victory. But I will, I will underscore, we thought that yesterday and the opposition pulled tricks and they used administrative procedure to bring it back up. So even though we think that we have just won, uh, we cannot actually know for certain for 48 hours due to logistics with Montana. So um, we're not gonna claim victory quite yet. Still gotta contact your legislators. Now, one more issue to add. South Dakota is actually fighting a different kind of bill. They're fighting a birth certificate ban. This bill would stop trans people from being able to update our birth certificates, name or gender marker. Last year, NCT waged a really strong campaign against the other attack there that I mentioned, the healthcare ban. And we helped build a lot of infrastructure last year. Now, advocates on the ground are saying that last year's campaign has really helped them this time around. They're better prepared to fight this healthcare ban because of our work there previously. So we're really proud of that and grateful to everyone who is a part of this effort, including some of the folks I see attending on the Zoom here tonight. Now, not all state legislation is bad, so I'm going to end on the good stuff. <laughs> Nine states have introduced pro-LGBTQ non-discrimination bills. There's also a possible ballot initiative in Michigan. We'll know more about the Michigan initiative in the coming weeks. The other states with pro-LGBTQ non-discrimination bills are Indiana, Mississippi, Nebraska, Alaska, Idaho, Missouri, Kentucky, Texas, and Arizona. So now that's everything for the states. And with that, I'll pass it back to Daniel. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Rigo, um, and as well as um, Mara and Dee for your wonderful wealth of information. Um, <clears throat> we are now going to address some of uh, the participants submitted questions regarding our discussion today. Um, and we have a little bit more time than we had planned on, which is fantastic. We will have about 25 minutes um, to answer any of your questions um, and elaborate on some of the work that we've outlined in today's webinar. Um, so the first question that I have here is about the USTS, um, and it was, uh, Mara, I think you were going to, you were going to address, um, the USTS as well. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, folks are just wondering, um, when the next iteration of the USTS will happen and it will happen in 2021. Um, it was scheduled, uh, uh, and I see we have Jody Herman on the call who's been, um, so integrally involved for 12 years now or so on, on the various iterations, but we, we were ready to do it in 2020, but then when the pandemic hit, we actually had a science advisory panel on March 14th scheduled and all hell broke loose with the pandemic. And at that meeting on March 14th, uh, we unanimously, uh, as the scientific advisory panel decided that it was too risky to try to do it in 2020. We didn't really know how the pandemic was going to shake out or influence things. So we put it off to 2021. The staff is hired, uh, the director of the survey and the outreach director, and um, you'll be seeing more about that in the coming months. We, should, we expect to collect the data in the fall. Great. Thank you, Mara. Um, let's see. Next pre-submitted question I have is from Christy. Um, it says, the recent fracturing of the Republican Party provides opportunities to build allies among officials who may not have had the political freedom to do so. How can we identify, connect, and amplify our voice with these individuals? Um, Rigo, you want to take this one on? Sure. 
Sure. Yeah, this is a really fascinating question. I mean, really what I would say is that although the uh, former president may have uh, given us a different idea of this, really there is growing support for transgender people across all political parties, including the Republican Party. The, uh, when, you, when you do polling about voters, including registered Republicans, you really find that everyday voters who are Republican are much more supportive of trans rights than the national uh, sort of heated rhetoric of the uh, leaders would lead you to believe. And now, you know, the question said this recent fracturing. I mean, I think that there's, uh, I don't know how much fracturing is really gonna happen. I think time's gonna tell. This is a really unusual time in our political history. But what we can really count on is two things. One, that state legislatures are always an entirely different beast than the federal government and entirely separate than whoever's president and any of those shenanigans. So we still need to be working hard uh, to build coalitions that even a, might include some conservatives uh, or elected officials who are Republican in the states, no matter what is going on federally. Um, you know, in Montana, uh, we have defeated, at least so far, defeated that healthcare ban because Republicans flipped their votes. We had Republican support in Montana. That is not a state that normally people would think is a bellwether for trans rights. But I mean, we're starting to win there now and no one would have thought that five years ago, I don't think. So the second thing I would say, keep in mind is that this, this support is growing for trans people around the country, across political parties. Um, and we're seeing that improve and improve and improve steadily over time due to our activism. So this is not a time to get complacent, nor is it a time to give up on people who may have different political views than us. I think this is actually a much more heartening time. This is really a sign to uh, continue with our activism, continue with our coalition building, and really making the case that transgender people are people. <laughs> it is not much more complicated than that. The transgender rights are a matter of respect, decency, and, and supporting each other. So uh, I think that's the way to go. Great, thank you, Rico. That was a great answer. Um, let's see. Our next question comes to us from Sophia. Um, and the question is, how can we fight for full trans healthcare coverage in the ACA or in a Medicare for all scenario? And uh, Dee, as our resident healthcare person, policy expert, would you like to take this one? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for that question, uh, Sophia. This is a great question. Um, this is actually a, a huge priority for us, whether we get healthcare coverage in the ACA or in you know, Medicare for all, as long as we get coverage, it's really vital for all of us to strengthen non-discrimination provisions within uh, whatever legis uh, legislation comes into Congress. Uh, I think where we need folks the most is when we ask to bring the noise, right? So there will be times where we need folks to call the representatives from both the Senate and the House. Um, and we need folks to let congressional members know that their constituents are watching them to do the right thing and to protect the trans community and our families. And like Rodrigo has said before, um, we have to uh, make sure to pay attention to pay attention to our action centers and alerts. And you know, please follow our social media accounts, our website, and then also check for emails that we could be sending out when some specific action is needed. Um, your voice is extremely important to us, and it's very important for Congress as well. So when you put your voice in the table, they know that you all are watching. So thank you for the question. Great. Um, our next question um, comes from, I, I see Sandra is online right now and comes from Sandra. Um, the question is, will NCTE do any work to pressure the VA to cover gender confirmation surgery? Um, and I think Mara, you uh, want to answer this one? Sure, absolutely. No, no, I'm, I'm absolutely kidding. <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, you know, Dee talked a little bit about it, but let me, let me say something unequivocal. We believe it is illegal in all 
aspects of healthcare in the United States for anybody to deny um, medically necessary, that is care that doctors and patients think that the patient needs um, um, because of gender identity and expression. We believe it is illegal. We are fighting, we're gonna fight it in the VA where there are regulations that disallow um, surgical procedures and disallow some other things that are super important to people. Um, we're gonna fight it in Medicare and Medicaid and we're gonna fight it with private insurers. I don't know if you saw in the New York Times today, um, Aetna has just sort of relented and said that it will cover things like, um, I think it was breast augmentation and electrolysis. And um, we believe this is illegal um, healthcare discrimination. Um, Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act protects people based on sex. Um, the Supreme Court has said that that covers us and we're gonna fight and we're gonna win. Um, you know, when, when I came out, you know, a little more than 20 years ago, there was no belief that insurance would ever cover anybody for anything. In fact, most of us couldn't even get insurance. And um, we now know that's illegal and we're going to win it. So yeah, Sandra, the VA is a real, real top priority for us as is TRICARE in the Defense Department um, where there are just, we think illegal regulations disallowing um, certain procedures for spouses and um, dependents. Thank you, Mara. Um, let me see. So it looks like our next question um, is submitted by Monica. Um, oh, this is a fun one. Um, what opportunities are there to work for NCTE and how can I apply? Thank you, Monica. This is basically a planned question because we have some of these opportunities. So Rigo, would you like to talk about them? Yes, I love this question. We are hiring right now. I was literally going through some applications right before this call. Uh, we are hiring for three positions right now. First one is office assistant. Uh, the second one is policy advocate slash counsel. And the third one is community organizer. Uh, I'm personally super excited, especially about the third one because it's a the community organizer role because it's a role we've never even had before. I mean, this represents real growth for the organization. Uh, so we're hiring for those three roles right now and you can apply through our website. So again, I get to plug transequality.org. I feel like I should have a little Chiron, you know, the bottom third of the screen when you watch TV and it says transequality.org. Uh, go to our website um, and you'll see up top, it says about and jobs. Or you can also do, I think it's transequality.org slash um slash about slash jobs and it'll you can apply right through there you'll see a lot more details about each of those roles you'll see the full description so you can get a lot more uh idea of what the roles are really like but again it's office assistant community organizer and policy advocate slash counsel in the future we uh anticipate hiring for even more roles uh we're going to keep growing over the course of this year so even if those three openings aren't a match for you, continue to check out the website, make sure you are, are subscribed to get our emails. We will always email our list when we have a job opening. And again, we do expect to continue hiring throughout the year. So we're really excited and, and maybe someone who's on this call is gonna join the team. Who knows, exciting times. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rigo. Um, let me see. The next question. Ooh, the next question comes from Kay, um, one of our lovely volunteers. Hi, Kay. Um, and Kay asked us, uh, would the Equality Act apply to military service to prevent bans on service in a future administration? And if not, is legislation needed? Um, Mara, you want to take this one? Absolutely, Kay, thank you. And, and Kay, thank you for all the work. Kay is our super uber volunteer at NCT and has just done so much and, and we really appreciate it. And, and Kay, this is also a really astute question. Um, you know, the truth is the president, um, president can tweet this policy away at any moment. Um, I, I don't think we have to worry about that with President Biden. Um, 
we, I should be clear, we do not have to worry about that with President Biden. Um, uh, and, and I don't know that we'd have to worry about it in future administrations. I've been saying since President Trump tweeted the ban um, that it was going to go away as soon as there was a new president, whether it was a Democrat or a Republican. We had a lot of, of very conservative Republicans who were against this ban. Um, Senator Shelby from Alabama, Senator Young from Indiana, Senator Ernst from Iowa. These are not people who we generally expect to, to support us, but they were, they were supportive of trans service members. And, um, and if any of them were president, they wouldn't do it. Um, but the truth is, until it's in law, um, it's a little less stable than it could be. And by the way, once it's in law, it could always be taken out of the law you know, in a later Congress. So nothing's permanent. Um, you know, even the Constitution can be tweaked, but we will be trying to get this um, enshrined in, in law. Um, and you'll see that this year, um, you'll see strong efforts this year by our side, um, trying to get the law passed to, 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 to enshrine this. Great, thank you, Mara. Um, let me see. The next question is submitted by Paula. Um, and Paula asks if there's any news on HB2 in North Carolina that created national attention four years ago. Uh, Rico, can you take this one? Yeah, I can take that. And Daniel, at least for me, your sound cut out at the end there, but um, don't know if that's just me. So yeah, this is a great question. Actually, we've got some leaders from North Carolina on this webinar right now. I know Aim Simmons, policy director, for Quality North Carolina is leading a big effort there. Uh, with this particular Zoom setup we have, we can't call on folks, but actually Ames, I'm going to, I'm going to answer, but if you, know, you have more to add, which I'm sure you will, you can use the chat function. And this goes for everybody. You can use the chat function if you just have a comment, um, but make sure to click the button that says all panelists and attendees so that everyone else can, can see it. So yeah, going back to the original question about HB2. So for anyone who doesn't uh, recall, HB2 was that infamous bathroom ban in North Carolina uh, over which there was a lot of uproar and NCTE along with many, many, many other organizations did a lot of organizing in response to. Uh, later on, uh, later that same year, I think it was, they, uh, the governor signed what was called a compromise bill, but, you know, very controversial, didn't go anywhere near as far as we wanted it to. A lot of times when people think of HB2 or really the quote unquote compromise that came after it, they think about the bathroom part, but let's not forget what really instigated this uh, or the, the sort of spark of it was local non-discrimination protections. Imagine it like a local version of the Equality Act. You know, municipalities updating their protections to say no one can be discriminated against because of their gender identity or their sexual orientation. Uh, there was a lot of really great organizing happening in North Carolina to pass these non-discrimination protections and then the state legislature intervened and tried to block that. Now that is sunsetting. Um, now the big opportunity here is that this year municipalities are finally going to be able, they're finally going to be allowed to update their non-discrimination policies again. They're going to be uh, permitted to, to uh, pass these new regulations that are going to be really, really helpful for our community. Equality North Carolina is doing a lot of work with these municipalities to get them out the gate to make sure that they add gender identity and sexual orientation to their uh, protections as soon as they can. And again, Ames, if I'm missing something or anyone else from North Carolina uh, who may be on this webinar, feel free to put it in the chat. But we're really excited about the opportunities uh, in North Carolina now and grateful to Equality North Carolina and local and state advocates for for pushing the ball this fall forward. It's um, no act, it's, you know, just because the municipalities would be allowed to put in protections this year doesn't mean that they would if they didn't get pushed. So shout out to all the state and local advocates who really make that possible this year.
Ames. Hey Ames, uh, do you wanna do you wanna say something? I can turn your mic on really quick if you'd like to. I'm gonna push the button. You can totally say. Oh. Hey Daniel, thank you, and thanks um, sure. Rigo for all the background, um, which is all the things that are actually true about North Carolina. Yes. Um, so we. Uh, are actually having a wave of cities that are enacting non-discrimination ordinances. Um, we started off with Hillsborough, which is a, a small town um, that is on uh, the, it's in Orange County, we have our own version here, um, which is in the Triangle, which is a more uh, liberal area of North Carolina, but still a small town. And um, we're seeing interest even um, in some of the more rural parts of North Carolina. Um, a lot of people are asking about our state legislature since they um, have just gaveled into session in earnest this afternoon. Um, like Rodrigo said, this is sort of the silly season of um, state legislatures right now, but we don't have any indication from the state legislature that they um, have any intention of redoing HB2 or HB142. And the speaker pro tem of the Senate has actually um, gone on the record with press to that effect. He did say that he thinks it'll be settled in the courts. So I think that that uh, he's, he clearly thinks that um, the, there's some way to win in the judiciary that, that we disagree with, um, but it will help cities um, to live not in fear, not in the shadow of the state legislature. So there are still um, preemption uh, laws in both Tennessee and Arkansas. So while um, we partially repealed ours here, they, they do exist elsewhere. And we also still, the restroom um, regulation is permanently preempted here. So until we fully repeal uh, HB 142, cities will not be able to protect um, the residents and workers in restrooms. Great, thank you so much, Ames. And I appreciate you just stepping up on the spot like that. It's very, uh, um, very kind of you to, to chime in. We appreciate it. Um, all right, let's see, next question here. Um, so I have a question from Bree. Um, it says, uh, Rodrigo mentioned some states for both the good and bad bills, such as Indiana and Kentucky. How does one conflict with the other? Um, and then Mara, did you wanna take this one? Yeah, absolutely, Bree, good to hear from you. Um, <clears throat> well, the easiest way to look at this is every state legislature has both good and bad people. Um, introduce, you know, the good people introduce good legislation, the bad people introduce bad legislation. You know, for a long time, every year when we were having bad legislation introduced, we'd see a bad bill in Massachusetts, for instance. It had no chance of passing, but there are knuckleheads in the Massachusetts legislature, even though they're not in the majority. So when you see, I, I don't know specifically about those states. I, I haven't been working much on, on um, state stuff myself this year, um, but, but that's part of it. There, there might be some good person in Indiana. You know, the, the Senator, spacing on his name from Omaha, introduced an anti-discrimination bill in, in Nebraska every year for decades and decades, and it never, never had much of a chance of, of, um, of passing. So that's part of it. Secondly, it's also true that sometimes people introduce good bills to offset the bad bill that they also want to vote for, so they can justify having voted for the bad thing to prove that they're not discriminatory. But usually it's just rarely I can't think of a single example where both a bad bill and a good bill were viable in the same state. That rarely happens. I hope that answered your question. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, okay, so we have time, it looks like for about one more question and then we'll wrap up. Um, before we get to this last question, I just wanted to let anybody know if you didn't get your answer, your questions answered, see there's still a few more on the Q&A and I apologize, we just only have so much time. Um, please feel free to send uh, me an email. Um, my email address is dshad, that's D-S-H-A-D, at transequality.org. And I will make sure that I forward that to the right person who can answer that question for you. Um, but before we do that, 
before we end this call, we'll take the last one. It's from Melissa. Um, and this question is, other than contacting our state representatives to encourage them to support trans rights in general, is there anything happening in some of the states that you didn't mention where volunteers can help? How can we be alerted to those state-specific needs? Um, and Melissa wants us to know that um, she currently lives in Wisconsin. I'm happy to take that one. I love the energy of people, you know, expressing interest in volunteering more. This is fantastic. Well, the number one thing is always to contact your legislators. Melissa's just saying she's got that covered, but I'm going to underscore it for everyone else here on this call. And then number two thing is think about who else you know who could contact their legislators. Because honestly, you are the most persuasive person to your own friends and families. I can give them a cold call at a phone bank, but they might not pick up my call. They're going to pick you up your call. So you're the one who's always going to be most persuasive. If you have any distant cousin, an ex-coworker, someone you used to babysit for who lives in one of these states uh, that needs support on fighting these bad bills, hit them up. But then the third thing, after you've done all that, is uh, to sign up with our partner organization, NEAT. Uh, that's N-E-A-T, National Equality Action Team. We partner with them a lot on this, on fighting these state legislation. The idea with NEAT is remote phone banking. So let's say, Melissa, you're in Wisconsin. If you sign up uh, with a shift there, then you can phone bank people who live in Montana or whatever that is and have them contact their elected officials. We collaborate with NEAT on a regular basis in state legislative session as a way for people who live all around the country to be able to support people on the ground in states that are under attack. Um, so that's the neat.org. Daniel just put that in the chat. Uh, and you'll also see opportunities to sign up if you follow NCTE on our social media channels and on our email list, we circulate uh, some of these opportunities as well. And Mara, I think has some more ideas of what folks can do. Yeah, I, I, Melissa, that is such a great question and I, and I so appreciate it. And, and what I'm just going to ask everybody is to, is to do what you can, look for opportunities, figure out what your superpower is, because um, we all have an activist superpower, you know, and, and sometimes it's calling your legislator, sometimes it's, it's actually going down to the Capitol and lobbying or, or writing an, a letter to the editor. Sometimes it's something else. Maybe your expertise is street theater, you know, get some street theater going, get, get a protest going, or just figure out what your thing is. Oh, you know what? Run for office. Um, you know, we, we finally this year, you know, have somebody going up before the United States Senate for confirmation in Dr. Levine, as we talked about. We now actually have a trans person in the country whose title is senator when only three years ago we got our first state legislator at all. Now we have somebody named um, Senator. And you know, I'm a huge fan and a big friend of, of Sarah McBride. So I, I don't mean this as a diss on Sarah at all. She's amazing. She's only one person. There are 872 state senators in this country and only one of them is trans. To put that in perspective, there is only one trans, uh, one trans state senator out of 1,800 in the whole country, but there are two state senators named McBride in Delaware. There are more McBride senators in Delaware than there are trans senators in the whole country. There's room for more. Run for office, that matters. Do you think if a bad bill came up in Delaware that Sarah would not be able to impact it? You know, we, we're working currently with um, Delegate Danica, uh, Danica Rome. Danica Rome in Virginia, uh, who's introduced a bill to eliminate the, the gay and trans panic defenses when, when somebody hurts an LGBT person and says, oh, I was so scared that it was a trans person. And, and Danica is going to get that done because she's there. And other people jumping in. And you know, that's, that's Danica's superpower. And that's um, Sarah's superpower. And now we have almost a, you know, 10 state legislators. That's not for everybody. Um, some of us live in places where we could never get elected because we live in very, very anti-trans places, but some of us don't. And 
look for what's right for you. Look for, for what your superpower is and then just go to town on it. Great. Thank you. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So we are going to wrap up now. Um, you know, I, as I already mentioned, if you have questions that weren't able to get answered tonight, we apologize. It is nine o'clock. Um, but um, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, again, my email address, dshod at transequality.org. Um, and uh, just to let you all know, we are hosting these uh, webinars quarterly. Right now, it's really the only way that we can um, meet meet with you all during this pandemic. Um, and, you know, we really uh, thank you for joining us, um, staying involved, staying engaged. Um, I am the Director of Development, as I mentioned, so one other plug. Um, I did want to let folks know if you want to support our work, please um, go to act.transequality.org slash donate. Um, I put a link in the chat. Um, we greatly appreciate any contribution you are able to and again, um, thank you all for, for being here tonight. Please enjoy the rest of your week. Um, and uh, again, thank you for your support. Daniel, thank you for running this, Daniel. And Ian Rigo, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you everyone for being here. Have a great night. Hey, y'all. Have a great night. <laughs>